So, Jay, I'm going to ask you the loaded question of, uh, given kind of the complexity of what we've talked about, you know, where do you factor transplant into um, approaching ALL patients? Um, 25 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard. It's challenging. So, I mean, I think we discussed that this, there are some presenting characteristics that make us a little bit worry about. So, you know, hypo, some chromosome molecular abnormalities, including pH like for some of these cases as we're learning more about them. So if they present, I think early on, it was, as we get that information, uh, kind of the two weeks into therapy or early on in the therapy, these are the patients that we'll be thinking about, at least planning for transplant, at least looking for some donor options. Uh, um, and if, certainly if they don't achieve, I think you know, what's clear is that the patients who are MRD positive at the end of the three months of induction one and two, or kind of a couple cycles of induction or the early consolidation, uh, consolidation one. So I think if you're MRD positive at that time, regardless if you're presenting characteristics like this, one of the higher uh, kind of prognostic, worst prognostic factors determine the continuation of the same therapy, uh, wouldn't be able to achieve a good MRD negativity cure. So these are the patients who are thinking about transplant. So for those patients, usually then, you know, the, tr the transplant trigger happens and we will usually give some MRD-directed therapy such as, you know, blinatumumab in the approved setting. And then if the hope, trying to get MRD negative before going to transplant. So I think we, I think we, we try our best. I think all of us trying to get MRD negative if possible when it's time to do so, when we have our tools to do so. For those patients who are MRD negative at the induction or consolidation or certainly the early induction therapies, I think those we usually continue in therapy not thinking about the transplant unless there's an MRD rising, uh, which kind of speaks to which I know we're going to talk a little bit about the MRD monitoring. So it's not just kind of the one and all. You have to continue to follow these kind of markers to see whether they are kind of the small clones arising. I think those patient population will be thinking about uh, the transplant uh, as well. Okay. Ryan, Rachel, any? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Jay, particularly um, patients who achieve early MRD negativity, uh, deferring transplant. And I think one thing that I've come to appreciate, um, when we refer a patient for transplant, generally not only are we hoping that that intervention is going to be effective uh, for them, not really knowing for sure that it's going to be effective. Unfortunately, we don't really have good tools to know for sure who's going to you know, derive benefit from a graft versus leukemia effect. But the other thing is it involves stopping a treatment that you've just demonstrated was very effective for that patient, <laughs> meaning chemotherapy. Uh, we don't typically continue the chemotherapy after transplant. So um, in a patient where you don't necessarily have any particularly high risk features, uh, you've started chemotherapy and it's proven to be highly effective by achieving MRD negativity early, if you're able to keep that patient on treatment, um, I think that is usually a better strategy than, than referring for transplant. Again, with a few exceptions, some of which we've already noted. But if they have a fully relapsed disease, I think I know we are talk a lot about the frontline therapy, but if they are kind of relapsed patients, I think that's clear setting that we definitely are thinking about transplant after salvage regimen once hopefully they can get a MRD negativity and then the transplant. So I think those are kind of more clear settings. But On the pediatric side, we, we transplant far fewer of our B or T ALL patients, particularly in the upfront setting. Uh, I think the one population of patients that has emerged recently that probably warrants consideration of stem cell transplant and for CR are those who uh, continue to be MRD positive at the end of our sort of second block of chemotherapy called consolidation. Uh, and that seems to be uh, really only amongst the NCI high-risk patients. Um, and so uh, you know, that's a group of patients that since that finding, uh, their event-free survival was around 40% without transplant. People have been referring for transplant. We are now in the children's oncology group studying if CAR-T can be uh, a definitively curative therapy for that group of patients uh, on AL 1721. Uh, and so that's an exciting trial where we can say, can we save them from a bone marrow transplant by using CAR T instead? Um, you know, I think as far as relapse patients, we actually don't transplant all of our relapse patients. We know there is a, a, you know, a subset of, of patients who can probably be cured even after relapsing with chemotherapy alone. And those are patients who have isolated bone marrow, uh, rel have bone marrow relapse uh, that occurs late. 36 months or more after diagnosis, uh, and some of the isolated extramedullary relapse patients, if they relapse greater than 18 months post uh, their initial diagnosis, those patients can be salvaged with chemotherapy alone as long as they respond to their reinduction regimen to an MRD less than 0.1%.